All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Molly McGrath, who is up in Colorado or across in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I always get this idea in my head that Colorado is above California, even though it's not. So just I'm a little <laughs> geographically challenged at times. Um, and and uh, Molly is from Hiring and Empowering Solutions. And, and Molly has coached and consulted and directed presidents and founders of national organizations and over 4,000 law firms in continuous improvement and, and team and power initiatives. And what we want to talk about today is this whole concept of, of follow-up. And, and Molly, you say that follow-up, is it's not sales, it's advocacy, and that you should enroll your client services team and really get them to dial for dollars with the client connect mindset. So let, let's start off with why, why do you say it's advocacy? You know, it's interesting. And thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. So often, you know, it's interesting. I'll hear from either the entrepreneur or the Salesforce team that um, they don't want to be a pain to people that have opted into whether it's online or called into their office, came in for initial consultation, whatever it might be. And so often I'll hear from them, well, people don't want to hear from us. People don't return our phone calls or our emails or what have you. And once they can shift their mindset to, especially during this pandemic, all of my um, entrepreneurs and my client service teams that are actually picking up the phone, I tell people the phone will make you rich because mm -hmm. so often people hide out behind technology. And since COVID, they're actually the first word out of the prospective client's mouth is, thank you for calling me. They are really delighted to hear from somebody. It communicates that you have a system and a process. It communicates that you're not just counting them as a lead or a number or what have you. And it, you know, the tonality and the message of what you say, of course, is very, very important. But the very fact that you pick up the phone and you shift your mindset to it's a place of connection and be an advocate of how can I serve you? How can I help direct you to taking the next right move? We've seen numbers do a complete turnaround in regards to their closing ratio, because at the end of the day, the, and you're responsible for the energy you bring into the room. So if you have all this fear and you have all this sales heaviness to when you're picking up a phone and following up with people, well, guess what? That's the result you're going to get. You're going to get resistance on the other line versus if you shift your mindset to be like, how can I be of service to you? Listen, you reached out to me. You told me you wanted to hear from me. And guess what? We have a process and we're following through and we're going to do exactly that. The numbers are just extraordinary the way they transform. Yeah, no, I love I love that phrase you just used this the sales heaviness because uh, it is interesting that uh, I don't know for some reason like the phone has become this thing where people are so as you said I mean a lot of people are so reluctant to pick it up and if they do pick it up they definitely pick it up with trepidation and an almost apology in their voice and who I mean who really wants to hear from somebody at the end of the day when you get a feeling that they're either going through a rote script or they just don't feel, they just don't sound like they're, they're happy to talk to you. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. So when you shift it, number one on that and, and eliminate the heaviness and you just come into it with, you reached out to us and did X, I'm following up to see what I could do to support you to make the next right move, to make the next informed decision. What further information do you need? And you be quiet and you be still and you be present and you actually listen to the people, even when people are grouchy, when they answer their mm -hmm. phone, they're like, who is this or what have you like, oh, so if you breathe some life, some possibility, some excitement into the phone, chances are they'll calm down. People meet you wherever you are. And so when you're bringing all of you know the defensiveness, even if they are grouchy or surprised when they pick up the phone, you can transform that experience very quickly. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love that because it is, it is very true because sometimes, unfortunately, if somebody does make a call and they do get somebody who's grouchy or dismissive or whatever it is, uh, 
they tend to adopt that themselves, as you said, and get defensive as opposed to, or get on the back foot as opposed to trying to turn it around in their favor. Because it's hard, let's face it, it's hard to stay, it's hard to stay grouchy at somebody who's very upbeat and excited and nice to you. Yeah, and authentic. We authentic. all have gotten those calls from salespeople where they, they're blowing fluff and they are, they're nice, they're bubbly, what have you, but they're missing the authenticity because they're missing the power of the pause where they just talk at you versus mm -hmm. really drop a powerful, deep, deeply curious question to check in with you and where you're at. And so often, you know, one of my favorite, favorite sales books that I ever read, this, this silly little book is like 20 some pages long. I think it costs four bucks on Amazon and it, it's called Get to Know. And the sooner you can get to 25 no's, that's where you start to get some gas in your tank. And it's on that 26 phone call where you start to really find your groove and things of that nature. So when I'm training your follow-up team or your client service mm -hmm. coordinators or care coordinators, what I call them, that support the sales force, I always tell them, listen, set your timer for one hour, make phone calls, dial for appointments, dial for dollars, dial for connection, whatever terminology resonates with you based on your personality. And at that hour, come back, let's hop on a Zoom and let's debrief. 100% of the time, they are completely transformed and they're excited, excited and fired up. Like, oh my God, this person said thank you. And then this person booked appointment. And once they get two, three, what have you, proof of concept that you have to keep going and you have to keep moving, then they find it. But it, it for whatever reason it is, there is a psychology and a science to, you have to get those 25 kind of junkie calls under your belt where you're like, oh, this is useless, but you have to keep going and keep showing up and manage your mindset along the way. And, and practice too. I mean, and part of it comes from, as, this, as you just mentioned there, the more you do it, tweaking it, figuring out what's working, what's what not working, um, being authentic. Uh, it's, it's like anything we, we attempt to do, right? We're never, we're never great at it out of the gate. We have to learn how to do it and we have to get into the right groove. But one of the things that you did mention that I really wanted to just come back on was an idea of the pause. Uh, and especially in this day and age of virtual meetings or a lot of things being done over the phone and all of that is like people are, I think sales people are very afraid of the pause often. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've done many podcasts and written about it in my books about the power of the pause. You know, it, it's usually the person that's offering that sacred space that gets uncomfortable with it. I actually got a sales call from a guy kind of going back and forth if I'm going to switch over to CRM, what have you. This guy's awesome. He'll call me, he'll email me, what have you. And I pay attention to exact words in his strategy, what have you. And what I love is when he called me this week, this is probably like follow-up number six that he's given to me. And truly I'm interested. I just have been really busy and I'm grateful mm -hmm. for his call. And he calls me, he's like, hey, you know, I know you told me you wanted to switch over to Clio. You're starting to look at it. Or what, what's going on? What's up? That's all he said. And he stopped. Mm -hmm. He stopped. Mm -hmm. He wasn't like, he didn't give me his dog and pony show. He didn't give, he's like, what's going on with you? What's up? Here yeah, he is. I, no, I think that's so, it, it, that's, it, that's great. And, but it, that takes some level of confidence because the natural instinct is to fill pauses. Yes. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, that's a great question. And I'm talking about my calendar. I'm talking about my time. I'm talking about my employees delegating back up to me. And if he's a good salesperson, he's present and paying attention and then reflecting back to me of what he heard from me. So it's really, you know, we get uncomfortable with the silence, right? The silence is in stereo and we feel like we just have to keep talking at people. But I think mm -hmm. one of the greatest skills when you shift it to a client connect call Hey, I'm just calling to connect with you. What's going on? Your language even changes. Your script even changes. Your verbiage, your tonality, your essence change in that where it's coming from a place of advocacy. You told me you wanted me to follow up with you, just honoring my word, delivering on my promise, what's been going on. And just yeah. find these really powerful questions that don't have a something answer. What's going on? Are you too busy or what have you? 
No, their answer might be they had COVID or they had a death or they lost an employee. You don't know, but we always assume that the knee jerk reaction is time or money. And often yeah. that's not it. Yeah. And I like also what you mentioned about, about being present, because I do think that is a huge struggle for people today because we live in this uh so I mean, people I, I i say this ad nauseum so i apologize to people who've listened to other podcasts <laughs> um is you know people go like oh, i'm so busy i'm the busiest i've ever been and i always go are you really or are you more distracted than you've ever been because mm. we're distracted by everything because we have our phones with you know notifications popping up we've got every on our computer yeah. notification there's so much going on or we perceive there's so much going on and we can't miss out on it is that it is so hard to be present and I think that's a real discipline. And I think that that's more and more what people are going to start picking up on is, are you truly present? Are you actually focused? And are you actually paying attention to the conversation that you you started with me? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great question to, to even ask people and to put within your sales process, because guess what? This is sales pop podcast. So mm. we are talking yeah. about sales. But, you know, the more that you, to your point, you practice it and you get deeply curious, you get still, you get present and you know, you can pick it up in their tonality. They're talking a mile a minute. You hear kids in the background, you hear whatever's going on and just be present and just check in with them and see where they're at. Nine out of 10 times, if not 10 out of 10 times, if you're present and you're listening to their words, they're giving you information for your next call. They're giving you your marketing messages to start to generate leads that lead to sales. And so they're, if you're really present, every phone call I'm in, my goal is to pick out a podcast title, to pick out a blog title, to pick out a marketing message from what every phone call I get on, existing client follow-up, sales, demo, whatever it is, having a podcast guest on my podcast. If I'm present, and I'm, I'm interacting it with that way. What message is they, can they give me? Because if they have this question, they have a struggle, chances are there's another 10, 20, 100 other people that do. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's a great point as well uh, for people to understand that the more you focus, the more present you are, the more likely you're going to pick up on on nuances, because uh, often that's it, it. It's often in the spaces in between where you find the most, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the most useful in, in, information. Yeah, you know, I and, and my niche in my industry is law firms, right? Mm -hmm. So they're trained skeptics. There's nobody busier. They have the attention span of a bed bug. It's very difficult to get a hold of them. I've been selling to that industry for 25 years now, and it's taken me a minute to figure out how to get their attention, how to get their time. It's one thing to get their time. It's one thing to get their attention where you're like, oh, great. I got like 10 minutes to just puke mm -hmm. all over them and try to sell them on X, Y, and Z versus just being really a safe container for them. And when they give you that message and then you hop on your next call, you're like, let me guess, you've been struggling with this, this, and this, which aren't the typical canned things that you find in a sales script because the voice of the customer, the prospective customer, they just hand delivered you the struggles because we all know the pain points are rather universal for business owners and or for whatever your niche industry is that you're in. Yeah. And as we said, I mean, it is the nuances because while everybody, while all of the pain points are pretty similar, everybody would like to tell you that theirs is very different from everybody else's. So, and even <laughs> though it's not, you have to capture that nuance. And you have to, you have to capture it. Then you have to acknowledge it because we all mm -hmm. know this, the way that people will stay engaged with you and stay in connection and then ultimately buy from you or do business with you is when they feel acknowledged, they feel understood, and then they feel heard and validated where you can reflect mm -hmm. back to them that they're not alone because I don't know about you, but every entrepreneur I talk to and business owner, you feel completely alone. You're getting hammered every way to Tuesday where you turn from employees to vendors, to clients, to what have you, and then you go home and it happens all over again. 
Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And that's why I think uh, what you said earlier about, you know, you have to be very engaged and, and authentic and present and, and empathetic, you know, try and understand the circumstances because it's very easy. Everybody talks about empathy, but it's very easy for us to get caught up in our own circumstances. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And training your team to do that. So when I use like the Client Connect campaign or your client service coordinator to support your sales force in enrolling them, because they're usually the director of first impressions. They're the ones on the front line, your intake coordinators, the people that mm -hmm. are handling and managing that first inquiry. I see so many business owners that have a massive miss where they treat them like just the receptionist or just the phone person and things of that nature. It, it, their job is more important than even the sales force is because they're the first that's the first stop, right? Is with the receptionist or whoever's handling your intake. So bring them in, have them shadow your, your initial consultations, have them shadow the process from the initial phone call through the life cycle of a lead and the life cycle of a hire so they can experience and they can communicate when you work with us, this is what you're going to experience. Because we all know, I mean, if Disneyland and Disney World's not taught us anything or Starbucks is that people will pay top dollar for an experience. Yeah, and, and I love that you brought that up because that is one of the things that uh, that I think people overlook because we hear a lot of talk, people uh, talk about customer experience and a lot of people pay lip service to it. But the reality of customer experience is it's the sum of all the interactions that they have from beginning to through that the whole life cycle. So if you think, well, we've got this super implementation team who are fantastic or our salespeople are fantastic, but you have left out the first part, as you just said, with the with maybe the sales development rep or whoever it is who contacts first, or you know, you overlook your customer service, whatever it is, unless you have some uniform experience. And the very first one, as you said, is absolutely critical. Yeah, you know, let's take my industry, for example. Mm -hmm. I work with attorneys, so people believe they're arrogant, that they're making millions of billions of dollars and rolling in the dough and they're missing a chip in regards to compassion and empathy is a stereotype out there. When I brought my receptionist into my first consultation with a client, with a client that hired us a firm and one of our processes going through a VIP session, I, she was literally in tears after she's like, and then I'm like, well, come sit on the second one, come sit on the third one, come sit on the fourth one. She's like, oh my goodness, this is how attorneys feel. This is what mm. they're dealing with. She had no idea. It completely transformed the way that she answered phone calls. It completely transformed the way that she did follow-up calls. She wasn't coming from a place that they're arrogant and rude and what have you. She heard firsthand once they became a client, what their pain points are, what their challenges were, and what we were up against to support them and transform. And I, and I love again that you've hit on another incredibly important point, and that's about making assumptions, uh, because mm. this is often the case where people do make assumptions about their prospects or, or customers, uh, rather than actually really try to get to know or understand what's going on. And it's unfortunate. I mean, it's a, it's a human trait of ours to make snap judgments and, and assumptions. But what you're talking about there is fantastic. It's actually getting people out there to understand firsthand the people they're dealing with. Because, yeah, how can you be empathetic if you can't be empathetic if you have no idea what's going on on the other side or what their life is like? And they will never, ever share with you if you don't have that sacred space. I always say, you know, they're human beings first and foremost. So when you pick up that phone, you are not, you're calling a human being, not a human doing. You are calling a human being that has struggles as an entrepreneur, business owner, what have you. You are not calling a lead or a prospect. And you have to understand what's in their head and their heart, where they get stuck, where they get stopped, where they have imposter syndrome, where their struggles are, what's waking them up at two o'clock in the morning. And until you understand that, then no, no, you'll never, ever get them to buy from you. Yeah, no, I think that's a, it's incredibly important, uh, that, that, that point that you're just making about really understanding, you know, the people that you're dealing with. And I like that idea, too, as I mean, it's probably a good practice for everybody not to refer to people as leads or, or prospects and maybe just to refer to them as who they are, what their name is, what their company is. 
Um, you know, just that little flip of the mindset probably can help a lot. Mm, absolutely. You know, you have to manage your mindset before you go in. And I, you have to anchor down and ground down before you go in and detach from the outcome, which is always, I have to get this X sales appointment, whatever the next right move is in your process versus of just how can I connect? And that's why I call it a client, client connect campaign, whether it's in the written word. So often I see people buy these canned email campaigns and sales campaigns and things. Some are great, what have you, but they're not really powering down to flip it from a place of, are these the exact things you would say to them face-to-face -face over a cup of coffee or on a phone call? And are you trying to sell to them or are you trying to connect with them? Yeah, no, again, I think that's a that's a great point as well. And I do think sometimes the the difference between how we might communicate verbally and how we communicate through through mm -hmm. uh, the written word, whether it be email or nowadays text even. Yeah. I think uh, I think people need to pay more attention to that and try and, and make sure and, and maybe read stuff back to themselves and say, how would I, if I received this, what would I think? How would I react to this? And, you know, sometimes as an entrepreneur, you can get a little tricky and you be like, oh, I'd be fine with that summit, but give it to sure. your receptionist, give it to your front stage people and have them read it and say, how would this land to you if you were receiving that? Because a second set of eyes that sits in a different seat in the organization is always where you're going to gain the greatest perspective. Yeah, and I think it all comes down to the end of the day is just being deliberate in everything you do. Uh, as you said, I mean, being being very deliberate as an organization and every element that interacts, being deliberate and, and uh, just not leaving things to, to chance because let's face it, when we when we get a little bit too uh, loose and fast and loose with things it <laughs> come apart very quickly. Yeah, and being really clear, I always say, you know, when I get sell scripts at the beginning, you know, you could do three, five, 10 follow up mm. calls, whatever it is, you're using 10% of it. So slash it in half, less is more, even in your email communication, I'm on one person sales pipeline, I love it. She sends like, two sentences with powerful questions and things that get my, my head moving. I'm like, you're my favorite email to read every day. It takes me less than a sip of a coffee, two seconds, I'm able to get through it. So less is more as long as you're intentional, clear and concise and right to the point. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if your emails are taking on like a, the form of war and peace novels, I would definitely, <laughs> definitely take a look at that. Hey, yes. Listen, Molly, this has been fantastic. Some great insights. Thank you so much for sharing with our audience. All of Molly's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yes, indeed. So I've been coaching and consulting by and large small and so, uh, small solo law firms and entrepreneurs, solopreneurs since 1997. You could check me out at hiringandempowering.com. I've been blogging every Thursday since 2008. I have a podcast as well. I'm going to have to have you on there, John, with me really and been podcasting. To. Yeah, for two years now. And I've written three number one Amazon bestseller books that you can see at our website under our resources tab. And in your spare time, <laughs> it doesn't sound like you have any. <laughs> no, I was joking. Um, so yeah, I would I would absolutely encourage people to check out check out. Uh, it's hiring hiring and empowering .com. And as I said, yep. all the links will be down there. And again, thank you so much, Molly, for joining us today. Uh, my name is John Golden. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.